welcome to Decoding the Gurus, a podcast where an anthropologist and a psychologist listen to the greatest minds the world has to offer, and we try to work out what they're talking about. I'm Matthew Brown, Australian extraordinaire, high-level skier, all of that. The guy over there is Christopher Kavanagh, dashingly handsome, Northern Irish, very young, smart brain on him. <laughs> No, no, it's uh, it's me. I had you all fooled, but it's it's me, Chris, doing the intro because Matthew is back from his world travels, back from the DTG company retreat in Japan, where we met up, as people heard, and he's managed to survive the trip, but not entirely. You're not operating at 100%. Is that fair to say, Professor Brown? That. Uh, is fair to say. G'day, Chris. Not a bad intro. I have some notes I'll share with those with you later. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no, it was a great holiday. Great to see you. Great to go skiing. Great to show off skiing. Mm-hmm. Be a big hit with your son, teaching him how to ski. Become an idol <laughs> for my <laughs> for my son. Yeah, I mean that that and poor that poor kid not having someone to look up to no. on the slopes. Um, not so no one to mentor him. No father figure. Hey, I went down. <laughs> I went down a red thing at the end, Matt. A Is red it? thing, a red slope, oh, good. you know? Oh, good job, good job. My wife wouldn't do that. But no, um, yeah, as so many people do, I picked up a little bit of a sickness, a bit of the plague, mm. the COVID plague on the way home. And um, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. A um, bit of coughing, all that stuff. But I'm, get, I'm on the mend. Point of order, point of order. Mm. It's probably COVID. We don't have a you diagnostic know, test to prove that. You know, this is, no. is that, I'm, I'm rigorous, Matt. I'm, I'm here, you know, fact checking <laughs> you live. So it's, but yeah. it, the symptomology, the epidemiology from, yeah. from cases that we've studied. We, I've located I, I, case, I've got case zero there. I've, I've got a, I know a guy, the, the, the child of my friends who did get diagnosed with it. And he is the one. He infected us all. That's hearsay and rumor, <laughs> but it's but it's it's fairly plausible. Fortunately, you're vaccinated. Many times we're not anti-vaccine here. <laughs> not anti-vaccine. <laughs> Famously, a non-anti-vaccine uh, podcast. Yeah, so it was all right. The only bit that I really didn't like was getting on the plane as I was inching my way back towards economy through the first class cabin, which is always a humiliating experience at the best of mm-hmm. times. And there was a young guy sitting there in first class, like 25 years old. That was his first crime, being much younger than me and enjoying his first class seat. But the second thing that really got me down was that he had a great big fat copy of Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life sitting there on his thing, which... I noticed. Yeah, oh. that would that's that like grinds the gears. I hope at the least that you audibly tutted on the way back. <laughs> Shake your head, say, Mate, I, you should check out your podcast. I wanted to punch yeah. him, but I couldn't. That stands the reason. One of my more communisty opinions, Chris, is I think we should ban first class and business class or any oh. classes any classes on aeroplanes. We should just have the one class because those different classes just make the other people feel bad. And I think we should give everyone a little bit more room. Yes, plane flights would be a little bit more expensive. We'll all travel a little bit less, but I should make they should make it so you just can't buy a more expensive seat. Everyone gets the same. And that way there's no envy, there's no injustice, and uh, no one has to get punched in first class. Yeah, that's a socialist take to start the podcast. But maybe I can sign on, off on this until I'm wealthy enough to travel in first class. And then I'll, I'll rescind my endorsement of that. But... I, I will say, whenever anybody is traveling first class and complaining about service in any way, I find it infuriating. Mm. I get it. Yes, there's little things that annoy you when traveling, but you know, you should have mm. compassion for the, <laughs> the rest of us who suffer yeah. those indignities alongside the broader indignity of economy class <laughs> in general. So yeah, just be careful what you're complaining about. Have you ever flown first class or business class? No, I don't think so. I have been in slightly better seats in like a domestic flight that, <laughs> that you had to pay slightly extra for, but it wasn't like an extra location or anything. So yeah, I, yeah. I don't think that counts. It's like no, you know the, the upgraded count. seats on uh, like Ryanair. That <laughs> sounds like, like Economy Plus or something. That does not, yeah. no, that does, that does not count. No, I, I've never flown anything other than Economy either. That's what you get for having a family in this day and age, Chris. And being an academic. Being an academic, if I was swanning around free man about town uh, without 
responsibilities. Maybe things would be different. Would you fly first class? <laughs> no, I don't think I would. I think I'd prefer to suffer and then stay. Like I, you could take that money and stay in like a first class hotel, <laughs> like a much nicer hotel when you get there for like a week. I know senior academics that only fly like business class and stuff. And, uh, you know, they, they, I remember because people were talking to me about being able to get all this work done, mm. which I sometimes endeavor to do on planes and, you know, it sort of works a bit, but, mm. uh, but there were, I was like, it's always the issue of, you know, the space. Right. And, uh, they're like, no, but you can just put it on there. And I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in the, then I realized, oh, you're always, you're traveling in a, like a, a different world than me. That's I why you. I see. Hey, are, yeah. they, are they getting paid? Is that getting paid by the university or do they pay for it themselves? Uh, yeah. So I guess so because they're traveling for, com- but this is like, these are like PI people, you know, because normally on I'm grants. I'm a PI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, hey, I've been a PI on some stuff. What am I talking about? But, but these are like PIs that. Well, no, maybe they're at your level, but you're busy now because... I'm at the highest level. There is no level above mine, Chris. Well, the, the reason I ask is because it's not possible, uh, as far as I know in Australia. Like, you, it's not allowed. No way. Yeah, yeah. But now the academics have their ways. Because that's the thing, like, on most grants, it says you can't reimburse tickets that are, you know, above a certain class or whatever. That's that's normal. No, no, Chris, I'm not, I'm not talking about the grants. I'm talking about the university. The, the university oh. will not let you. Wow. Doesn't matter. In fact, even at CSIRO, the Australian Government Research Organization, where I also worked, uh, and I think most government places are the same. I remember my my mentor and supervisor, Bill Venables, who was like a world renowned statistician, also happened to be really very large. He had health problems, right? He had health problems, which actually led to him being large, heavy guy, not very healthy. He's the kind of person that would die from deep vein thrombosis and stuff on a plane, right? Is he still alive? I hope so. I haven't checked in on him recently. Okay. Well, if you're listening, Bill, <laughs> you know, yeah. we're, I hope we're you're just- alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. but but they wanted him to go and to. He was invited to go on this world tour, giving lectures, right, to people right, to, right. about statistics and R and stuff, because you know he's smart guy. Yeah, and he had to jump through all of these hoops. Because like he just physically couldn't do it unless he went first class, right? He would probably die. But that was like a big deal for oh, that exception to be made. Yeah. I anyway. don't know what. I don't know. It's, it's different. It's different if you're in the C suite. If you're up there with the associate vice chancellors and the you know, the, the vice chancellors of those people, they, they fly first class. I'd say the majority of academics don't, but I just know a lot who seem to be very comfortable in business uh, and maybe higher. Right? And that might be that might be the kind of academics I'm dealing with, Matt. <laughs> you know, the, the fat cats of the academic world. But, so I don't see those spoils. So, yeah, that's that's it. But, yeah, so that this has been your advertisement for why don't we lift everyone's boat? Why don't we make all the seats a little bit nicer for everyone? We can take some of the niceness out of the first class. <laughs> yeah. And spread it around economy. It wouldn't. It would be like spreading a little bit of butter over a lot of bread, but even so, it would all be you know incrementally better off. Um, we'd all have to pay a bit more. Well, that's okay. Well, millionaires we just don't need a bit more. Like, shouldn't it? <laughs> shouldn't it do that? If we, <laughs> we should do the online leftist thing. If we just take Bill Gates' money, we'll be able to pay for first class seats for everybody for a hundred years. That's it. I don't to- get why it doesn't work, Matt. So <laughs> you know, this is why people come to this podcast for economic analysis, apart from setting the economic system and plain travel systems to right. We are here for a purpose, Matt. Oh, and, and by the way, should you want more of our unstructured waffling and particular discussions about the experience in Japan at the Rio Can, more so than you got, there is a bunch of videos and audio stuff on the Patreon there's a long extended discussion on plagiarism, academic plagiarism. If you want to hear us discuss that with a, a glass of whiskey or two. But what we're here for today, Matt, we're not doing the Sean Carroll decoding, which is the next decoding we have planned. A treat for you, a reward for all the terrible people that we cover. Instead, you know, to gently bring you back into the fold and give you a chance to build up your decoding muscles, you know, to let your lungs recover. We're, we're doing one of those relatively short, focused 
decodings on a specific, really a tweet actually that went viral. So a little bit, a little bit different, but it touches on a bunch of topics that we're interested in. Okay. But I have one comment to make before we get into it, Chris, which is, yes, yes. is there any way to make your bloody camera stop zooming in on you and moving around every time you move? Because it's making me feel seasick. Oh, <laughs> it's God. really, yeah, really right. annoying. Look, there's a little button called center stage that I think is switched off. Okay. Not oh. that. I'm miles away. <laughs> that's fine. Right. That's, that, that's, where I, that's where I want you, Chris. <laughs> Stay there. The poor Patreon people, they'll just be all sad now. Uh, it's uh, not small Chris. cinematic. He's even, he looks even smaller now. <laughs> <laughs> so the clip, Matt, why don't I play it for you and then I'll explain the context. Is that yeah. the right way to do it? Okay. Yeah. Could yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll play it first so that it, I don't give you any preconceptions. Or the listeners, really, because I know you've already heard it. <laughs> but, but here we go. Many, maybe most legal systems are based on this idea, this belief in human rights. But human rights are just like heaven and like God. It's just a fictional story that we've invented and spread around. It may be a very nice story. It may be a very attractive story. We want to believe it. But it's just a story. It's not a reality. It is not a biological reality. Just as jellyfish and woodpeckers and ostriches have no rights, homo sapiens have no rights also. Take a human, cut him open, look inside, you find their blood and you find the heart and lungs and kidneys, but you don't find there any rights. The only place you find rights is in the fictional stories that humans have invented and spread around. And the same thing is also true in the political field. States and nations are also like human rights and like God and like heaven. They too are, are, are just stories. A mountain is a reality. You can see it, you can touch it, you can even smell it. But Israel or the United States, they are just stories, very powerful stories, stories we might want to believe very much, but still they are just stories. You can't really see the United States. You cannot touch it. You cannot smell it. So that was Yuval Noah Harari, somebody that actually we are planning to cover in the future, a mm -hmm. Israeli historian, philosopher, author, wrote a book, Sapiens and Homo Deus. And there he is giving a TEDx talk, I believe in 2014, TEDx Jaffa. It's an old video and the specific clip that I played to you, went viral on Twitter. Various people shared it around. One of them, someone called Scarlett Johnson, a political scientist, grassroots activist, daughter of a Marine Corps vet and blah, 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 right? Said in response to this video, in a tweet that has 3.1 million views, if you believe this, is there any horror you cannot justify? This was retweeted wildly with yeah. uh, a lot of people outraged. So what did you think about, were you similarly outraged? <laughs> well, that's how it came across my desk, <laughs> shall we say, as well, which was that, yeah, it was getting um, retweeted. There was uh, an outrage farming going on. Uh, initially, pretty much the religious right, I think, in the United States, who, who like to find things to be outraged about, even if it's a, a relatively tepid 10-year-old TEDx snippet, because, you know, this goes to their idea of, you know, atheistic socialists who believe in nothing, you know, nihilistic point of view where, you know, un unless you actually have faith in the reality of the eternal nature of God, the United States and the flag and all that stuff, then, you know, you'll just be, you know, sniffing your own farts <laughs> and wallowing in your own crapulence yeah. as socialists are want to do. I was free to wallow in my own crapulence. So that was the original outrage thing, but it was interesting to see academic philosophers get in on the act as well, hey? Oh, we'll get to them. <laughs> we'll get to them. <laughs> but before we get off the religious right, I do want to say that I think part of the reason that Harari triggered them is that at the start, he says human rights are just like heaven and like God. It's just a fictional story that we've invented and spread around. It may be a nice story, maybe a very attractive story. We want to believe it, but it's just a story. So I think that is the bit that like, you know, set him up 
for angering religious people because they don't like it when you present their stories as, you know, comparative to fiction, right? Like yeah. that is not good. Now, I would say when I heard this, the general takeaway I got from it is he's wanting to emphasize that humans have the capacity for symbolic culture and that we invent ideas like nations and democracy and human rights and languages and so on, and that these are very important and that this distinguishes humans from other animals in, in very important respects. So if we care about those things, we have to take consideration that they aren't like the others. They're, they're reliant on humans coming up to some sort of shared agreement about their importance. Now, that felt obvious to me, especially because so many cultural evolution theorists have emphasized this point about the ultra sociality of humans, right? Like, why are humans able to cooperate in so many, in such large numbers beyond like genetic kin? Lots of explanations, but a lot of them revolve around having symbolic culture and cumulative cultural capacities, right? So to me, this is nothing new. And it was very clear that he is not saying that these things are not important. Yeah. And the fact that they are symbolic means that we shouldn't invest our passions in defending them or that kind of thing. Well, you would say that because you're a godless materialist reductionist, Chris. Um, and I would too. You know, the other thing too is that I thought, I mean, I'm not a big fan of um, Yuval Harari, and I'm not a fan of TEDx talky. Yeah. Um, and and this was a perfect example of that, where you want to make a point. His point is, hey, ideas are important, man. Um, let's yeah. talk about the importance of ideas, but they're not tangibly real. It's a pretty basic trite point. He was dressing it up in some flowery language, you know, rather than describing it in terms of social constructivism or in terms of symbolic ideas or transmissible culture and stuff like that. He was talking about as stories that Fiction we, that we stories. fictional yeah. stories that, that we made up and told ourselves, you know, to sex up his talk a little bit. And then of course th that sexing up ironically is the thing that triggers the little outrage cycle we saw. Yeah, although also part of the outrage cycle here is that Harari is in the pantheon of right-wing villains, right? Infowars often references him. He's like, if Klaus Schwab is the like evil deity at the top, yeah. Harari is somewhere down in the demigod status. Like he's he he's mm. a neoliberal Jewish person. Jewish. That's <laughs> yeah. So, so already he's not not doing well. And he's it's like futurist in certain respects, right? So his villain status already makes him like a suitable, you know, it's very easy to whip yeah. up anger at him. And the fact that he appeared to be disparaging religion helps. And just to highlight, Matt, Paul Vanderclay, a religious person on Twitter who I've interacted with before, he was pointing out this video and promoting a response to it from some religious talk show kind of thing, looks like a religious talk show, some guy called Glenn Scrivener. And he was saying that their response is pure <laughs> Jonathan Peugeot and, and Jordan Peterson. So, so let me play uh, the response that they had to this clip for the little one that he highlighted. Why do you think this went viral on Twitter? I've never seen that clip and it's extraordinary to me that when he says, oh, mount like, I can see a mountain. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you don't actually. What you see is a conglomeration of rocks and things like that. But yeah. he, like, will adopt a standpoint and see these things and yes. go, that's a mountain. How do you know yeah. it's not a hill? That's right. How do you know right? it's not a hill? And why is it? When does? Because if he just sees a few rocks... Yeah. Would he go, it's a mountain? Yes. No, he wouldn't. He has to be, and he arbitrarily selects a certain point at which, yep. or he might say social convention does that and, yep. and, and, yep. and says, this is a mountain. And he goes, now that's a mountain. Yes. That's fact. Yes. But then if he sees in a conglomeration of human beings and either, and so there's a point at which people go, oh no, that's the United States. And he goes, oh no, you see, I can't buy into that. <laughs> I'm having a conglomeration of rocks, but not a conglomeration of yeah, human yeah, beings. Yeah, yeah. You're like, dude, you're metaphysical trash. Trousers are down. We can see how you're being <laughs> thick. I yeah. sort of feel embarrassed yeah, yeah, yeah. for him, really. Yeah. This kind of pseudo philosophical wordplay is so annoying, isn't it? Because it sounds smart, <laughs> superficial. The sense makers love this. This is what mm. they love to do, right? Like anytime that somebody suggests that something is 
objectively yeah. exists or whatever. They're like, ah, you know, yeah. like, so, yeah. so. That, how, can like, you say, how can you say that egregores are any less real than a sun, say? Because a sun is just a concept. It's just an idea that we've applied to, you know, a bunch of hydrogen and helium that happens to be in the same place. You know, these are just concepts, Chris. So, you know, yeah. egregores are just as real as stars. There's plenty of legitimate arguments that you could make to somebody being too glib about, you know, the way concepts work or whatever. But, like, the central thing he's saying, like, he would agree if they wanted to emphasize this point that, you know, what we deem mountains and what is a hill, it's actually like a social convention, which, you know, there are, there are fuzzy bounds. Like Harari would be down with all that. Yeah, of course. He's not talking like, about like, that. He's not making that distinction. <laughs> it's still, that's right. That's right. That's not his point. As we've said before, it's not a very interesting point. It's probably a, a boring TEDx talk that he gave, right? I, I don't know. But he's just saying that there are tangible material things and there are things that are sort of cultural ideas and things like that that sort of live in our heads and that you cannot point to any place in the physical world <laughs> where they actually exist. Yeah, and just to make this point clear, he was wasn't in the larger talk arguing that because human rights derive from like symbolic culture or whatever that they're they're not important or that you know that all these concepts they're just you know compared to the objective reality they're so fluffy and and nonsense like this is from later in the talk i went and listened to the talk so here's him talking about you know what makes humans special you will never catch a chimpanzee standing in front of an audience of 200 other chimps and giving a talk about bananas or about humans or something only humans do such things it should also be said, however, that chimps not only don't give talks to strangers, they don't also don't have prisons, they don't have concentration camps, they don't have slaughterhouses, they don't have arms factories. Cooperation is not always nice. Often when we think about cooperation, we think about Sesame Street and, and teaching children to cooperate together, but all the terrible things that humans have been doing, still are doing in the world, they too are the outcome of this ability to cooperate flexibly in very, very large numbers. Now, suppose I've managed to convince you that the secret of success of our species is this ability to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. The next question that immediately arises in the mind of an inquisitive person is how exactly humans do it. What gives us this ability to do something no other animal can do? And the answer is our imagination. Humans cooperate flexibly in large numbers because humans can create imagined realities together. Yeah, he's saying this intangible stuff, this conceptual stuff, this cultural stuff is terribly, terribly important. Two-edged sword can be used for great things or terrible things. Yeah. Even if you're religious, Matt, Harari's atheist or whatever, right? But you can actually take from this that he's saying human cultural products or human imagined realities that we share, which maybe, you know, you can, if you want, and you say, you know, God helped to create those in man through the, you know, the, the kind of instincts that he developed. This should be freaking gravy for the sense makers. This is what they love, yeah. right? Talking about symbolism and the importance of imagined realities. And all. So he actually was making a point which they would be on board with, but because they were so triggered by the, you know, the reference to fiction in, in regards to religion. It's taken one that he's arguing human rights aren't important and, you know, that they're a fiction in, in terms of like, yeah, you know, but he's not saying that. He's not saying human rights are no. not important. No. Or two, that religion is a, you know, a terrible thing that we should transcend. And he, again, isn't saying that either. Like he, <laughs> might, he might think that, but that's not what he's arguing at all. He's arguing mm. that all these imagined realities like states, like democracy, like religion, are hugely important for human societies, yeah. which obviously they are. So yeah. it's a, it's a mund it should be a mundane <laughs> point, right? The, the kind of point which is like, what is money? You know, the money yeah. that you have in your pocket, it's just paper and metal. And the only thing that gives it value is people are willing to treat it and treat it 
like it has inherent yeah. value and that's yeah. just a shared convention what if society broke down and mad, mad and you're like yes that that actually is an interesting thing to realize but most people realize that in their <laughs> teens <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? and, and you're right though that there's something special and triggering about him saying that natural and all human rights are are imaginary right or are invented but people wouldn't have a problem if you said that people invented democracy right or money or money or, f- or freaking anything right but that we went down a little bit of a rabbit hole didn't we and in finding out that there is a stream of respectable thought not amongst the religious right but amongst a much broader stream of philosophers and other people that human rights and natural rights are are not a human invention like democracy or money but actually exist independently of Oh, their, their mind independent, I think, is the jargon that they want to use for it. But like, so, yeah, so you mentioned academic philosophers, Matt, and in a rare clasping across the boundaries, right, that meme, you had the religious right and the, the sense speakers and the philosophers, I actually think they're fairly, they're not a huge distance <laughs> apart. I describe them a little bit like Pokemon, you know, the beast Pokemon and the evolved version with philosophers being the evolved version of sense speakers now i don't know who that's more insulting for but i i do think there's at least connections there but the bit that is not always so in step was that academic philosophers were likewise very annoyed by this clip from harari and what triggered them was not the reference to religion as being a fiction they didn't really care <laughs> about that point what they got triggered by, and I will say it's triggered, is because he referenced human rights. And apparently there is a developed debate within philosophical circles about the nature of rights and whether they are what I would say a kind of naturalistic science-based perspective would be is that human symbolic culture relies on humans existing. So the concept of rights has to develop from human symbolic culture. So you, you go back to the dinosaurs, you, you don't have any concept of rights, but there are a class of philosophers, including ones that classify themselves as naturalists, who think that those concepts existed without humans and that there's very complications about it. But that's that's why. So how do you use the other example? He wouldn't have triggered the reaction, but they were very annoyed because they said, what a simplistic way to, you know, treat a very complex topic about rights. Yeah. So the interesting thing about this, Chris, is it puts you and me, uh, reductionist materialists that we are, in the same camp as uh, Michel Foucault and other people because they would describe this kind of rights as being totally socially constructed, right? Which is really yeah, I guess so. saying the same I mean, thing. I, as, <laughs> it, I, just, just, just trust me on that one. At least I, I okay. think I'm probably right. Whereas it's more the liberal, I guess, philosophers who would talk about natural rights and inalienable sorts of things. And they sometimes would say that they derive from the divine mm-hmm. God or a godlike essence in people or something. Or if you get a bit more sophisticated you and less religious, you might say that they arise by our inherent human qualities. From that argument, you'd say that natural rights or human rights arise because humans as being conscious, intelligent creatures or whatever, just, just naturally want to be free, that kind of thing, right? Not be oppressed. Yes, and uh, I was... Helpfully sent a link to, you know, the Stanford philosophy page, which has a long entry about these kind of debates. But I couldn't help but notice that whenever it's referencing it, a lot of the points of the people who are who want to argue that they are not mind dependent or whatever, it will reference the source can be supernatural or an unspecified but kind of mystic it, it, I'm sorry, it is. Like it's it's kind of like a realm of concepts or something, you know, that uh, yeah, the yeah, ether like or whatever. Platonic it's, eternal forms. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll be triggering the philosophers, but I don't mind. I'm sorry. Because the point I want to emphasize with this was, you know, take whatever philosophy you want. You you can be a like theistic philosopher if you so believe. That's you know, that's your Bag. But the point for me is that both of those groups, the academic philosophers and the religious reactionaries on Twitter, they both were just focusing 
on this little thing that they, you know, this part of yeah, the speech. That's right. Like they, he's, like, that's right. We have to remind people, these were just examples, right? He was not making a point about human rights or natural rights or about religion. He was making a point about transmissible culture and the importance of, of cooperation and ideas in, in, in fueling organized uh, um, um, endeavors. Yes, and almost universally, I will say from interacting with some philosophers, I cannot speak for all of them, but and and a few just looking to the religious right, they seem to get that wrong. Like they didn't infer that the broader point of the talk is actually a promotion of the importance of like imagined realities, right, for humans. So like they they kind of assumed that he was, you know, saying he was sort of dissing. Reality. Yeah, he was saying yeah. he, was, he was implying he was implying that either God or human rights are important or uh, yeah, or yeah, which he wasn't. And it was it was very <laughs> obvious to me. So so you know, it's just you know, it was work on your theory of mind, guys. Work on your theory <laughs> of mind. Figure out what the person's trying to communicate, what their motivations are rather than zeroing in on the syntax that would be my yeah advice. and I, I i do think it's occasionally worth looking into the context of why harari is a particularly triggering individual um for the you know the reactionary right just a, a five minute google search will reveal to you his position in you know conspiracy theorist lore and mm. and whatnot which which seems like you might consider it when addressing this kind of topic but i don't know philosophers are very good at focusing on individual words or in this way they share a lot with sense makers <laughs> that that's what they like to do and and actually just making, making simple things extremely complicated you mean <laughs> <laughs> but don't don't say that but when I, I will say another like an external example is um a guy alex o'connor who's doing a bunch of interviews recently with various figures peter hitchens stormed out of an interview with him and he's, he's kind of like an atheist philosopher. Anyway, he recently did an episode with Pajot and they enjoyed a productive, symbolic laden philosopher slash sense maker crossover with nary a word about, you know, the lurid conspiracism and religious apologetic style reasoning that, that Pajot applies. And both seemed very happy that they were able to, you know, achieve such an important reaching across dialogue. And I, I thought really... The same is hard to be impressed by because the fact that philosophers and sense makers can talk together and enjoy this kind of thing, I could have told you that that uh, yeah. from from my experience with both of them. So I'm sorry, I'm not besmirching all philosophers. I know there are plenty of philosophers who are, you know, they also find issue with conspiracy theorists and sense makers and and this kind of thing. So I'm not I'm my, I've, I'm not casting aspersions at the entire philosophy field. And I know that very many smart people have spent many decades talking about rights and how they can be independent from mind. Yep. And a lot of religious scholars have spent a long time arguing how many angels dance on the head of a pin. You know, I don't know be- why you would use that analogy. That's not fair. They're gonna oh Oh, we're coming back with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the normal people won't do the. When I say normal, I mean like reasonable <laughs> type people won't understand why philosophers are going to be as slightly mad at us. But you have to be doing something right to get some set of philosophers mad at you. Yeah. Like the philosophers would agree; they're all mad with each other. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. But this, this is a, uh, you know, that that's it. There's <laughs> that clip. Just to be clear again, like. Harari is, I think both of us agree, it's a fairly mundane observation just about humans having symbolic culture and it it being important, right? Our cumulative culture. In some respects, the thing which distinguishes us from almost all other animals, the capacity to communicate, create cumulative culture and and like share intentionality in in a kind of bonding and um, whatnot way. But uh, that to me seems unobjectionable, but but not particularly mind blowing. But no. Well, anyway, I'll I'll be keen to um, look at her. Maybe it was a bit unfair to him. Maybe maybe I think he's all right when we cover him. I started reading Sapiens and I, I got bored and stopped. So I, I can't really speak to I it. believe part I- of the issue is, you know, he, he does long big picture history and so if you know specifics of any of the topics he covers it's really oversimplifying claims and complexities and yeah. that gets so he gets you know if you do big history for all of human civilization and history you're really going to annoy a large diverse set of people so yeah. 
Stephen Pinker, for instance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's in the same category. So, but Chris, speaking of um, culture and monkeys, after you die, you'll go to chimpanzee heaven. And there you'll receive lots and lots of bananas. When we were in Japan, my wife, I didn't actually go to see them, but she took photos for me. She went to see the uh, snow monkeys. Nihonzaru. Nihonzaru. Macaques. Macaques, are they? Yeah, I think they're Japanese macaques. Anyway. Very, very famous. People have probably seen the beautiful photos of the, the snow monkeys sitting in the steaming pond or, or um, hot spring bath. <laughs> <Pond>. <laughs> so I don't know what yeah. they're called. Hot spring. <laughs> hot spring. <laughs> hot spring. Hot spring. You know, but what is also pretty well known, but my wife saw it for herself, is that uh, not all the monkeys are allowed into the spring. Mm -hmm. There's the alpha, high status family, males and females, and and their children, maybe cousins. I don't know how far it extends. But, you know, the in-group, the aristocrats, Mm -hmm. they're in there having a lovely bath. And meanwhile, all of the other members of the macaque troop are sitting there literally (laughs) clutching their shoulders, like huddled together for warmth in the snow because they're not allowed to get into the spring, even though there's room for everyone. There's room in the spring for everyone, but they're not allowed in because of monkey society. Does that remind you of another species that behaves like this, Chris? I like how you've tied this into our opening segment with the discussion of first class plane travel. Oh, you know, yeah, right? yeah. See, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, been... you meant to do it. You <laughs> yeah. this whole discussion <laughs> leading to that. But yes, that's, that's right. That I'm, the, I'm, I'm the monkey shivering in the snow at the back <laughs> of the plane. <laughs> they should let me in first class. This is right. Jordan Peterson, Hooperman, and Joe Rogan are the monkeys luxuriating in the. Um, a hot yeah. spring and, and telling everybody else the benefits of cold water plunges uh, <laughs> yeah. while they retreat to their mansions. So yes, I, I agree. The proletariat macaques need to, <laughs> need to seize back the means of uh, yeah. water heating production and yeah. uh, enjoy the sport. But Matt, you answer one question to me. If you cut open a macaque, where do you see that, that status? How do they... You mm. cut open a macaque, there's no status there. Wait, wait a second, this is blowing my mind. Like, uh, yeah. are you telling me that monkeys have some kind of symbolic system of reasoning as well? Have you thought yeah. this through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this would, I'm sure this is in your wheelhouse, right? Because this is what comparative anthropology. Mm-hmm. And I love that stuff. Well, I mean, one, like monkeys are bastards, right? They're bastards. I've, I've met yep, monkeys. Yep all over the world and they've never been anything other than horrible but they're very clever they're a lot like us and in one spot that they figured out that they could steal tourist stuff right and that they'd, they'd race up a tree you know the sunglasses this is pretty famous yeah. most, most people know this right and they'll hold on to your sunglasses until you chuck them a banana then they'll drop the sunglasses so it's basically extortion right they're, they're, they're it, it's, it's bl- <laughs> they've invented they're, extortion they've invented they, extortion <laughs> there's, a, there's a good example Matt because the limitation there for the monkeys and why we don't don't have the capitalist class <laughs> developing amongst them is that typically with some limited examples they're not great at passing down that kind of knowledge across generations neither there are a couple of notable exceptions but it's the cumulative culture and the capacity for passing down information and cultural learning which is the hallmark so but but actually they do have this is a good example. You know, we're primates, we're cousins, we've got close common ancestors. And like us, and like many other species too, they are concerned about prestige and hierarchy or, or status. Yeah, social uh, status. Hierarchies. Yeah, so they, they are modeling a component of relations in their, you know, mental wheel space. But yet... Yeah. They didn't invent rights or no. or democracy. So what's the difference? Yeah, yeah. or socialism. <laughs> That's right. They need to invent socialism. But you know, but this is is good. I think it sort of speaks to Paris point because I generally, even though it's bland, I generally agree with it. Like monkey societies suck, and they're pretty similar to basic sort of like state of nature type human psychology scale human societies before we developed like yeah, larger right. communities and and shared cultures. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we were just another primate on the block for a long time. Yeah, it's basically a kind of um, very hierarchical, totally status-driven, oppressive kind of society. Oh, Matt. Oh, careful, careful. The anthropologists are, uh, I can feel them cringing within mm-hmm. because what do, plenty what of examples. Wrong? What did I get wrong? 
Well, just oh, plenty Bonob- of examples. Are you going to mention Bonobos or something? No, 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 I'm not. I'm those little freak kicks. <laughs> I'm, I'm, those sexy little bastards. We talked about it with Manvir. Oh, you weren't here. <laughs> you were drunk at the time. Um, but, the, you know, the, there's plenty of societies where you have small-scale societies or hunter-gatherer yeah, style. Yeah, they're not always nasty. Societies. No, no, no. They, they don't always form in the hierarchies. In fact, mm, there's plenty yeah. of examples where there are anti-hierarchy social organizations. So it, it isn't necessarily a fundamental feature for society to function that you would have to have this rigid like uh, social hierarchy system. This is something that various anthropologists and sure. social science people want to emphasize that, you know, like, like Jordan Peterson looking at nature and saying the status hierarchies of lobsters, that, that it's such a primal component that, you know, you, you simply can't understand human society without understanding that, that that is a core component that can never be removed. And the notion that prestige biases and that there are status and stuff, I think he's actually like right there, but he's wrong on the notion that you know, it has to form in the kind of uh, a rigid hierarchy type thing. Yeah, like 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 yeah. status and social cachet, reputation is always important, but it doesn't necessarily ossify into and a humans. Hierarchy. Humans are like a ve- but it, exactly by the point that Harari is making. We can create yeah. cultural systems that are much more egalitarian. And whatnot. Yeah. So that that's the the difference. That's the point I was trying to make. Just the relatively weak version of that, which is that we can make things more sophisticated, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, but it does at least expand the universe of possibilities, including this great state of Queensland, this great country of Australia where we live in the best of all possible uh, worlds. <laughs> well, that took a that took a, a surprisingly parochial turn. But, yeah. Well look, I just demonstrating anthropologists getting triggered over the mention of natural hierarchies and and whatnot so yeah it's all complicated matt we can all agree but well i'm with harari natural doesn't mean good and this is where jordan peterson's wrong that natural doesn't mean inevitable either right natural no. usually not very good and certainly not inevitable and um you know you just got to be aware of it common misreading of old dawkins right that because he said selfish genes that he was saying we should be selfish and humans are selfish and no that was actually the opposite we're not tailored to the gene mm-hmm. drives because of our cultural values so a similar point commonly misinterpreted and equally somebody that annoys philosophers um the for some valid reasons as, as well so, so uh, there we go matt look we tied it all up you see how many little threads we wove and we pulled it all together we're, yep. we're getting back into the swing of this we'll yep. we'll be decoding gurus in a full-length episode in no time yep i'm feeling healthier just having spoken to you off the air you mentioned that you know it's difficult if you laugh uh, because, you know, it, it can induce coughing, so you have to be careful. And so for that reason, I was 20 to 30% less funny than usual. But listeners might uh, have might have noticed that. that. So if there's any of that, it was purely mm. to protect Matt's lungs. That's, <laughs> that's why I was yeah. doing any jokes that didn't land, any, com- you know, it was all in service of protecting the most important member of the, the Guru's pod team, the most wow. vulnerable. You could say. Wow, <laughs> this gives us something to look forward to. Excited to see how you're going to perform back when. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Take it. Well, there we go, Matt. A little, the daily delivery on Twitter and elsewhere of outrage from various different factions and stupid clips surfacing years and years after <laughs> they, they were made. This, this is what social media was made for, to, yep. to make people outraged about out of context clips and lucky for us that they are because it gives it's grist to our mill chris gives us uh, a position to give a reasonable considered um and fundamentally correct take on events but there's one message that i want to leave people with which is monkeys are bastards never trust a monkey or a philosopher (laughs) right (laughs) that's that's a good message to end on some of my best friends are philosophers i'll just (laughs) some of them I, i assume are good people now we'll leave with that and we'll return soon enough with full length decodings other things that you can expect and and thank you all have a wondrous day out there don't worry about hierarchies and you know money what is it anyway it doesn't mean anything it's it's just like a made-up concept yeah like you know 
Imagine, Chris. There's no countries. Imagine. Mm. And no religion, too. It's easy if you try. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Food for thought. Adios. Adios, amigos. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.